Michelle, thanks for coming to Gatecrashers HQ. Yeah, uh, has it always been a sketchy warehouse by the docks? Yeah, so I built a wrestling ring. Oh, I didn't know you had any carpentry skills. That's awesome. What? No. I use, like, driftwood and large rubber bands that I found by the highway. But what I wanted to test out is jumping from, like, the turnbuckle thing. Um, yeah, you know what? You you go first. I'll watch. Mm -hmm. uh. Oh, yeah, brother. I'm gonna be the people's champ. Oh. That went better than I thought, honestly. Welcome to Gate Crashers, a podcast dedicated to kicking open the door to your next favorite thing. Our mission, our creed, our code is this, to make all nerdy things more approachable and accessible to everyone. We want you to find a universe that you'll fall in love with. I'm Vishal Golapali, and my pronouns are he, him. And I'm Dan. I use he, him pronouns. Hey, how are you? I'm glad to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. It's been a while. Yeah, this is our um, second wrestling episode. This is my second wrestling experience. Nice. When? All right, let's talk about that. When did you get into wrestling? Um, the fall of 2019. So, your first uh, wrestling episode was AEW. I mm -hmm. got into wrestling because one of my friends started watching wrestling with the first episode of Dynamite, and he wouldn't stop talking about it. And just got me into it by osmosis, basically. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, it's, I, I feel like it has such like connective tissue with superhero stuff and like all the kind of things that are like the stuff that we like love. So it all makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. My other like kind of wrestling experience is just that when I was a kid, I had one friend who liked the WWE a lot, and he convinced me to buy the SmackDown vs. Raw video games on the PlayStation 2. And I will say, like, even before I actually started watching wrestling for real, getting to play as The Undertaker and hit people with the Tombstone pile driver is the coolest feeling, and it this is how you get people in. Yeah, I the the games are such a good like like, I feel like most people have played wrestling games, maybe even even if they haven't watched actual wrestling. Yeah. Because usually they're just a lot of fun to play. Mm -hmm. Um, But today we are talking about something similar to WWE, but not quite the same. So what are we talking about today, Vishal? We are talking about NXT, which is kind of a brand for WWE. We'll get into that. So what would you say is like, if you had to give like a back of the box blurb about what NXT is, what would you say? Okay. If the main WWE shows, SmackDown and Raw, are like Hollywood blockbusters, then NXT is closer to Broadway. It's where you get genuinely incredible wrestling with really strong production values and compelling stories. You get a lot of fresh faces coming into a bigger stage and they get to become hometown heroes. And then these heroes get to cement their legacy and become legends. Such a such a good summary of like wrestling. Yeah. I read this earlier. And I was like, wow, Sean knows this. Like he, he's real good at this. <laughs> Thank you. So would you can you give us some background on what NXT is? OK, so. In the 80s, 90s, um, there were these wrestling territories, like different companies uh, had shows in different areas. Wrestlers could kind of jump between them because they needed to make the money wherever they could, with champions generally uh, committing to one or two territories. And WWF at the time, now WWE, got very, very popular and squashed everything to the point that 
their only main competitor by the end, World Championship Wrestling, WCW, uh, Vince McMahon bought them out and basically put a monopoly on mainstream wrestling in the United States. So from then on, the territory companies still existed, but they didn't really have TV deals and they were not very popular. Uh, WWE partnered with one of them, Ohio Valley Wrestling, to be their kind of developmental area. So OVW would bring in a lot of newcomers who wanted to be wrestlers. They would train and develop followings over at OVW, and then WWE would take all the best ones. And prime examples of this are John Cena, Randy Orton, and Brock Lesnar all came through there. Very successful, if you think about it. Yeah, those are those are names that I I mean John Cena. Yeah. Um I even know Brock Lesnar. So like that's wow. That's mm-hmm. a big program. Yeah, so eventually WWE decided, "Hey, we don't want to like have this kind of outsourced program. We want to bring all of this in-house." So they brought it in-house with Florida Championship Wrestling, FCW, which became their new um I guess training or developmental program and some lesser known, but like pretty popular modern wrestlers came from FCW, got Kofi Kingston, uh, Daniel Bryan and the former AEW champion, John Moxley, who at WWE went by Dean Ambrose all came through FCW. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I did want to ask about John Dean Ambrose. Which one is his human name? Like what is his like, Neither one of them is his human name. His real person name is John Good. And huh. when he wrestled before he went to FCW, he went by John Moxley because sometimes they don't want their professional name mm-hmm. associated with their real person name for obvious reasons. Yeah. And WWE specifically w- wants trademarks and copyrights over their superstars names whenever possible. So if you come in from the indies and you don't have a really well-established name, then they're going to change it. I never even thought about the names as being like a brand thing. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, so John Moxley, kept, no one outside of WWE can say Dean Ambrose, so they'll get a cease and desist or worse. Wow. That is not fun. Mm-hmm. Huh. Okay. Well, now, now, wow. Uh, well, that makes sense, knowing what I know about Vince McMahon. Um, but dang. Yeah. Okay, so NXT, though, started off as, like, a D show. So there was, you know, there was SmackDown, the A show, or Raw was the A show. SmackDown was the B show. FCW would be, like, the developmental show. And then there was NXT, which was a reality show where FCW trainees would compete for fan votes and the winner would get a spot on the WWE main roster. What? Yeah. So they wait, picked like NXT. Yeah. It Go was a, it was like a reality show? Yes. When it started, it oh. was like they would go through wrestling challenges they would cut promos, they would have matches, they were mentored by WWE superstars. And fans would vote on them every week, and the winner would make it to the main roster or get an opportunity to go to the main roster. I, I'm like shot. I, so from what what I know of modern wrestling, it's WWE, NXT, and AEW. Mm-hmm. Like I never would have assumed this started as like a like a real world for wrestling. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. The original NXT, the reality show era of NXT, wasn't really great. It had four complete seasons. The fifth season just kind of kept going on and on and on until they just turned it into what it is now. But the first four seasons, the winners were Wade Barrett, who was mentored by Chris Jericho, and he got injured and is now a commentator for NXT. So not great. But he had a decent little tenure at WWE, won a couple championships. His story was also the best spinning out of early NXT because he formed a group called The Nexus with all of the people in that first season of NXT. And he brought them in and were like, hey, 
these guys also all deserve opportunities and they like came in and started beating people up it was great it's a good gimmick yeah then after that uh they had a guy who is now known as low key who won season two of nxt and pretty much immediately left wwe he's not there anymore does he do anything else now or he just... wrestles at impact i believe but i don't follow like most american wrestling outside of wwe and aew okay impact is the tuesday night one right yeah they just moved to thursdays but yeah is that the one that kenny omega went to yes okay all right um there was caitlin who retired from wwe in 2014 and has her own business and stuff now i think she came out on top there and the last winner of NXT was Johnny Curtis, who is now known as Fandango. And he had a pretty bad time on the main roster and went back to NXT fairly recently to win his first ever championship. Huh. And this was all like 2010 to 2013. Mm hmm. So then after that, WWE closed down FCW and moved all of their talent to NXT or the main roster and let the rest go. So uh, John Moxley, Dean Ambrose, he came in directly from FCW. He didn't go through NXT. So he went. <laughs> I, I don't say this in a way to be um, negative of the brand, but is this <laughs> like. You've got the Varsity, which is WWE, and this is like the JV? Yeah. Or is it like, okay. All yeah, right, it's, makes, it's pretty similar to that. That makes sense in my my squirrel brain. Mm -hmm. and that's definitely what NXT was for a while. So then after they moved fully to NXT, WWE announced Arrival, which was an event on the WWE Network, which would kind of make NXT a new mainstay for the company. And turn it into, like, not a solid brand, but like, hey, this is a thing you should watch. And from there, it really took on a life of its own. Arrival is was a really fun little show. And the talent on there was really good. And people wanted to watch more, and it kind of kept going from there. So, oh, you go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask about what some of the major storylines have been so far. Yeah, so, right spinning out of Arrival, the match of the night, the one that got everyone talking about NXT, was Sami Zayn versus Cesaro, which the story going in was Sami Zayn is a guy with all the heart in the world, and Cesaro is one of the best, like, in-ring wrestlers ever. And all Sami wants is for the respect of Cesaro. And this is their fourth match. They have had three brutal matches together and sammy is desperately trying to get cesaro to just recognize that he's talented and they burned the house down they did an incredible job and people who were already watching nxc at the time already loved sammy people who started with a rival fell in love with sammy and from there it he was kind of the main character of nxt the rest of the story continued on to him fighting his former friend Adrian Neville to win the NXT Championship, and then having his actual real-life best friend Kevin Owens join the roster and then betray him and beat him up. Aww. Sammy and Kevin had a little feud, and then Sammy got injured, and things kind of kept moving on. But it is very safe to say that, like, NXT exists because Sami Zayn did such a good job convincing everyone it was worth watching. There's some other pretty important stories there, too. The four horsewomen were Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Sasha Banks, and Bayley, who all went through NXT. All four of them are ridiculously good wrestlers. All four of them are top stars on the main roster today. They got their initial following in NXT, and specifically turned what WWE called Divas Wrestling for, like, decades into now women's wrestling. Charlotte Flair specifically got rid of the Divas belt and replaced it with the WWE women's belt. That's awesome. 
I I actually didn't know Becky started in NXT. Yeah. That's news to me. Huh. Yeah, Becky is the only one of them who never won the NXT championship, which is pretty ironic because of the four of them, she is by far the most popular. Yeah, I... I would say so. I know I only know Charlotte Flair because of their rivalry. I worked with Becky for a bit, like her, more so Seth. But, um, like I try to follow that story a little bit. It's mm-hmm. it's that's interesting that you came from here. Yeah. So then another main important story of NXT was Finn Balor, who basically heralded the new age of NXT. Like Sami Zayn was. From the American Indies, he was not exactly a homegrown talent, but, like, he was an American talent. American audiences loved him. Finn Balor, before he came to NXT, was known as Prince Devitt, and he wrestled in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And he was a pretty big deal there. He won their Junior Heavyweight Championship, and he founded the Bullet Club, which you might have heard of. I have. I was I was going to ask you about that, because I, me, I... As I said, I don't know too much about wrestling, but the Bullet Club was always something like I saw people with shirts of and like it was always in the front window at Hot Topic. And I didn't. Yeah. Huh. I didn't know that he's the one who made it. Yeah, he founded it. It was a group of four people and it just kind of expanded from there once he actually left Japan for NXT. It was his run in New Japan was pretty good. But personally, I think his work in NXT is some of the best wrestling ever for new Japan. Was he there when, um, like Kenny Omega and, um, all them were, or were they different eras? Um, so Kenny Omega was not a member of the bullet club while Finn Balor was there, but he, they did wrestle a few times in new Japan. Uh, he was the leader of the bullet club when the young bucks joined them. Mm -hmm. And he would end up leaving about a year after he founded the Bullet Club and Kenny Omega would join them about a year after that. Oh, I didn't even know they were in the Bullet Club. Huh. Small world. Yeah. Probably going to have to do a New Japan episode at some point. Yeah. All right. Um, Another pretty major storyline or not storyline, but like wrestler is Asuka, who is... In my opinion, the best women's wrestler of all time. She, much like Finn Balor, came from Japan. And while she was on NXT, she did not lose a single match. She, they knew that she was such a good wrestler that it was impossible to have her lose and make it look good. (laughs) That's awesome. She ha- still has the record for the longest NXT Women's Championship reign at like 500-something days. And the only reason she gave it up is because she got injured and relinquished the title. And then she got called up to the main roster. Yeah, cause she she won something big recently, didn't she? Yeah, she has been the Raw Women's Champion for almost a year now. That's it. Her. Then my personal favorite story at NXT is the feud between Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, which is about these two guys who become best friends and like brothers, win the tag team championships together, and then one of them betrays the other and starts a blood feud. It's some of the most heartbreaking and gut-punchy storytelling in all of wrestling, for my money. And these guys are two of my favorite wrestlers in the world. And the last uh, major storyline of NXT, and the one that we're going to be talking about today, is about Adam Cole and the Undisputed Era, a faction that formed in NXT, dominated for a while, and has very recently fallen apart. Yeah, saw that, that hardcore last night. Yeah. So... What would you say are like some major themes of NXT? So because NXT, when it started, was about training these wrestlers to be called up to the main roster, it's always kind of centered around ambition. It was you want to be good enough to win a championship because being a champion proves you are good enough to make it in the big leagues. 
And while NXT has kind of gone off on its own since then, it still that's still the core of it. You go to NXT because everyone has the opportunity to vie for a championship. And at any point, if you really make a name for yourself, you'll get the you will get your title shot. So for people who might like this, um, for wrestling fans, NXT is a fantastic intermediate between the sports sports like style of New Japan Pro Wrestling and WWE's more entertainment oriented product. The structure of WWE stories remain while the match quality of New Japan or AEW gets the spotlight. Also, anyone who wants to watch women's wrestling will have a great time with NXT. But if you're not into wrestling, what would you compare this to? So NXT is like the new mutants to WWE's X-Men. It's more intimate. Like a big thing was that for a very long time, NXT only filmed and they only performed at Full Sail University in one arena in Florida. And so the crowd there was the same people who went there every week. So it was legitimately like, These people had a real connection to these wrestlers. They weren't just watching them on TV. They saw them every week. And so it's developed such this very close relationship with its fans. And it has such a unique style compared to WWE's big sold out arenas touring the country, touring the globe every week that. It's basically its own property now. Yeah, you can connect the two, and they are connected to a degree. But it is very possible that someone who doesn't like the main roster loves NXT. And vice versa, to a degree. Um. If you want to jump in right away, you can watch the next episode. NXT airs on USA at 8 p.m. every Tuesday. Um, In addition, all episodes of NXT go up on Peacock, WWE Network outside of the U.S., 24 hours after they air. So if you don't have a cable subscription, you can get them there. Um, Where would you personally start? So personally, I started all the way back in 2014 with NXT Arrival and literally watched every single episode to catch up to what was at that point, like early 2020. Wow. Yeah, it was a lot. And I personally enjoyed every second of it. But if you don't want to make that obscene commitment, you can start at pretty much any NXT takeover because takeovers are like wrestling. They're the pay-per-views of NXT. They are conclusions to the storylines over the last three months, and they are beginnings of new storylines. And... Oh, oh, sorry. The most recent NXT takeover is... Takeover Stand and Deliver, which aired uh, Wednesday, April 7th, and Thursday, April 8th. It was the only two-night takeover so far, and as we're talking, it was literally yesterday. Yeah, I watched the second night of it, so I got a lot of thoughts and feelings. Um, So now we're going to go and chat about it. If you want to avoid any spoilers for Stand and Deliver... um, I would come back after you've watched it and hear our thoughts. First, I just want to talk about my feelings towards NXT um, because I, this was my stand and deliver was like my first actual experience with it. I had known because like my friend, uh, all of my friends watch it. Like all of my friend, like I've had so many friends throughout my life love wrestling and I just never got into it until AEW because like it felt like a really good place to start because it was so new. But NXT had like and it's it's cool because it has such a different flavor to it than AEW does. Like with AEW, the matches, the matches are like the production quality doesn't seem as high, um, like nowhere near as high. Mm hmm. And NXT felt a little bit more tight from what I saw. Like, the camera was a lot closer, which I really liked, because it felt like 
these are real people, but like that these two characters, like I could hear them say things to each other. Like, um, who, who said I made you? That was, was Adam it, um, Cole. Yeah. Adam, that was awesome. Like that whole fight, like they, they did like a cool sizzle reel before to kind of explain the story. But like knowing that little bit and then watching that and like hear him say something like that and like kick him was awesome. Yeah. Um, the uh, skulls at the standover were incredible. Like it was a really well designed and like tight space that it, it didn't feel anything like wrestling that I'd seen before. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say it opened with Poppy. So that was a big <laughs> one for me. That um, <laughs> that's that's what really drove it home, starting with that. I'm a huge Poppy fan. Um, I actually interviewed her, so I was super excited. Um, and she's she's performed at NXT before, right? Yeah, she um played Io Shirai's theme uh for one of her matches. Once she played her she played her entrance, basically. Huh, that's interesting. Um, but I I really liked NXT. Like I I went in like kind of expecting WWE. When I really shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Um, And you mentioned it offhand. So Stephanie McMahon is Vince's daughter, but she's married to Triple H. Yeah. And Triple H runs NXT. So it's like his thing. Mm hmm. Does he still wrestle or like or does he do like how Vince used to do? Um, he doesn't even show up like Vince used to. He has like shown up a handful of times in the five years of NXT and really only for really important stuff. Like, oh, when a rival happens, he did a little promo in the ring to start the event, stuff like that. He doesn't wrestle anymore. Oh, that's awesome. I like that he has a more hands off, um, not ownership, but like, you know, like he runs the joint. Yeah. Um, but I, I was super like it just felt like the production quality was a lot higher than what I'd seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, don't really love the screens. Yeah, that was yeah. new. The uh, NXT's production quality is always at its best at takeovers because these are their big once every few mm-hmm. months events. And they go all out like the skull was brand new for this takeover for takeover 30. They had a giant X in the middle of the stage, kind of the same way. The screens I had never seen before. That was weird. Does WWE do the screens? Um, WWE does does the screens, but for me it's even worse. So they don't have a live crowd. They have screens of fans all through like where the crowd would be. So not just yeah. in the back. It felt like a weird like 1984. Like everyone was watching these matches. Like <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on. But I, I, that's so cool that it was filmed at full sale. So like, it was like these art college students going to see this every week, or was it like locals as well? Uh, both. Yeah, locals and people. Like one of my friends uh, who lives in Jacksonville would drive mm-hmm. down every couple of weeks to catch a show. Back when they would film at full sale, in 2019 they started actually touring with their shows, mm-hmm. which was kind of sad and changed the vibe of the show a lot but like they have a much bigger audience now so i i watched a couple matches that weren't in um stand and deliver so i watched finn finn balor versus pete dunn at nxt takeover vengeance day Mm -hmm. is (laughs) let's talk about like actual fighting so is finn like a grappler like what is his style So when Finn first started at NXT, he was kind of this really quick high flyer. Like you've seen him do the jump off the top rope where he just Mm -hmm. steps on them. That was like he was younger. He jumped around the ring. He kicked people a lot. But that was in 2014 and 2015. And in 2020 and 2021, he has significantly changed his style to be a lot more gra- do a lot more grappling, do a lot of mat wrestling and mm. show off that he's not just a guy who jumps around, he is a very technically proficient wrestler too. So my brother is like a like a state champ wrestler. Like a regular wrestler. Like I don't I don't know 
what you would call it. But watching this match felt more like a I don't 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 come at me when I say real wrestling, but like like the sport wrestling more than the entertainment wrestling. Yeah. Like I felt I felt like I was really watching like them try to like go for points. Um it is that something that is always relevant in NXT, or is that just like something that he, the, he used to do? That's specific to wrestler. So Pete Dunn has always been that kind of wrestler, and Finn Balor changed his approach to be more like that fairly recently. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's very much up to the wrestlers, and it leads to a lot of diversity in match styles. So you'll get some high flyers flipping around and doing crazy stuff, and you'll also get people like Finn Balor and Pete Dunn driving each other into the mat and trying to make it look as real as possible. And personally, I have a lot of affection for the high-flying stunts, but oh, yeah. when it looks real, it is the best possible product for me. Yeah, it, it a lot of the NXT stuff looked real. Like, it, a lot of... Right, listen, you're not jumping off high ropes and hitting the floor and it not... You not feel something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never want to like act like it's not real, but like a lot of, you know, the hits yeah. aren't like, they're not hitting each other to hit each other. Um, and it's, <laughs> I think I might say this in the AEW episode, but it's kind of like ballet. Like every, every move is so beautifully done. Yeah. Like it's meant to look like you're, you're hitting, but like it's, you know that it's not, but you suspend your, your disbelief because it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other match I watched before the, I watched I watched clips of a couple others, but I watched the Finn Balor versus Adam Cole on NXT um, from March tenth, twenty twenty one. This one is also uh, some comments and questions about fighting style. Finn is the one jumping on Adam's chest, right? Yes. That had to hurt. Like those moves, I, I know there's like a like there's a art to it, but that looks like he jumped on that dude's chest. I was like, holy crap! Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. So Finn is, I think if I had to choose one, he is my favorite wrestler in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was entirely because when I was watching that classic NXT and I saw him do that finisher for the first time, it was incredible. Like, having watched it over and over again, I can see how he shifts his balance a little bit to try and minimize the amount of actual damage the guy takes. But mm. no matter what he does, it looks nasty, and it still has to feel nasty. Yeah, that's if anyone touching your chest with their feet is not fun. <laughs> I, oh, <laughs> besides, um, okay, tell me about that. Do they like? I'm I'm from a fighting game mindset. Do people have like finishing moves and like special moves like they specifically use? Yes, it is. They're called finishers, and then the less good ones, but that are still really cool, are called signatures. So Finn's mm -hmm. finishing move is the coup de grace, which is you, literally, he jumps from the top rope and steps, stomps on your chest. Adam Ow. Cole's finisher is the last shot, where he runs against the ropes and then hits you with a knee to the back of your head. Ow! Yeah. Like, he jumped, like, is he bringing, like, a flying knee? It's, or does he bring it's you a back? running knee, and he jumps Oof. while he's sprinting towards you. <laughs> That's that is a killer. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and there's was it? Yeah, I've got lots of thoughts on their match from last night because that was awesome. Yeah. Um, is Cole a kicker? Yeah, he uses his legs a lot. His he kicks and he uses his knees all the time. But he's also. He has stuff like, you know, he'll put you on his shoulders and then drop your neck on his knee. Ouch. I felt that's what I like. I really liked about watching these different NXT clips is that I felt like I could pick up on those things more than I could with AEW. Like mm -hmm. I could see people's signature like I was like, oh, this this suit's a kicker. Like he's like doing this kind of stuff. That's how he fights and like the grappling and things like that. Yeah. I felt like it was a lot more technique based, which was cool. Mm hmm. Um, But. Let's <laughs> let's talk about stand and deliver, um, because there was something that made me an automatic fan of 
<laughs> NXT. And listen, anyone who listens knows I have an affinity for the best way to describe it is clown girls. Um, and Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart came in, came out in a tank with like all this neon clothing. And it, like, I was like, oh, I think I like NXT now. <laughs> And then I don't remember, I think it was um, someone in the Discord sent sent a picture of Shotzi with a Freddy Krueger club on. Mm-hmm. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this may have awoken something in me. <laughs> uh, they, the the women's wrestling in this, I AEW didn't feel like it had any women's wrestling until I saw, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name. Um... I'm a simp for liking her. What is her name? Uh, Maki Ito? Ma- Maki Ito. Until I saw Maki Ito, it didn't feel like they had any uh, female representation. I was like, oh, I love her. Yeah, they have but, recently gotten into it, but it was a big criticism of the first couple of years. Yeah, and that's how it kind of felt when I started watching it. But this, like, it was like headliner, and it, it was cool. Like, I really enjoyed that because it did, as you said, they weren't like, it didn't feel like divas. Like, when I was growing up, it kind of felt they were never treated as like equal mm-hmm. as everyone else. And that was never really cool. Like I remember China was one of the big ones yeah. when I was growing up. Um, so like those people never really got like their fair shake. And I felt like when I saw Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart, like that match was awesome. Like it like went from zero to a hundred quick. Yeah. All right. Do they have special, do they have special moves that you can tell me? Yes. So Shotzi is, isn't great. So Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart, I like them as a team because Shotzi is a little bit rusty in the ring, but she makes up for it by having a very distinct look and a very fun character and personality. Mm -hmm. Ember Moon has kind of tended to lack in a distinct personality, but she is one of the best wrestlers in the ring. So as a tag team, they're really good together. Shotzi's finishing move is this... They call it a senton, but I never really understood what that meant. She jumps off of the ropes and, like, leans back and lands on you with her ass. Oh. Okay. So, like, she just kind of, like... Yeah, she falls, like, back first or butt first onto her opponent. And how long have they been wrestling for um, NXT? So, Ember Moon actually was an NXT champion. She was the first NXT champion after Asuka left. But she went up to the main roster, didn't have a great time there, and came back down last year. Shotzi Blackheart wrestled in the indie circuit for a very long time before being picked up for NXT, I think also last year. Huh. Like, did they come... I'm trying to think, like, how... Were they from other leagues? Like, do they get, like... Not, like, pulled up into the big leagues, but do they get, like, recruited? Is there someone going out to, like events to see wrestlers they want for their leagues yeah so that's a big part of triple h running nxt is that he pays attention to wrestling outside of wwe and he sees who people are excited for and who's really talented and he will send you know nxt people out to like talk to them and be like hey do you want to wrestle for nxt and because of how wwe is it may not always be the best choice for a lot of wrestlers But for a lot of other ones, it is a great opportunity and a great way to get an audience. Yeah, and this is the only way I can compare it because this is the only mindset I know. It's kind of like working for Marvel or DC. Like, everything you create really isn't yours to a point. Yeah. Like, you're getting paid well, but, like, you don't get to keep your toys at the end of the day. Yeah. But instead of you writing a character... You're you, and they own that, which is, like, another level of, like, weirdness. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you think of their match last night? So, I thought that it was pretty fun. It was probably, of that night, it might have been my least favorite, but the mm-hmm. worst takeover matches are still pretty darn good. And I had a really fun time with it. Yeah, I, I thought it was a really good match. Um... As far as like I can tell, um, I I never am too sure about the rules of wrestling. <laughs> like, 
like especially with tag teams because like sometimes people just gang up and like the one other person is waiting outside the ring and if like let's say jake and i were tag team wrestlers like if some like two people were ganging up on him i would just go through the ropes yeah so the official rule is that when you tag out or your tag partner tags themselves in um you have five seconds or not five seconds to the referee's count of five to get out of the ring. So you can mm-hmm. do whatever you want with that five count. OK, that makes sense. Hmm. Um, so another one I did want to bring up is the um, Bronson Reed versus Johnny Garganto. Um, what do they have any backstory that I didn't like don't really know about? Not really. Johnny Gargano has been. He's been a mainstay of NXT. He is the first NXT champion to, once he lost the championship, he didn't get called up to the main roster because he's not a very tall guy and the main roster doesn't treat short people very well. And he's not even that short, but like short for wrestlers. You know what I mean? Wait, really? Yeah. I, you know what? I never even would have thought about that based on like height but, like, I guess I, that kind of makes sense to me. Like, not like it's a good thing, but, like, I, I can't think of, like, any superstars who are, like, short. Yeah, it's, Rey Mysterio is the only real exception, and it's because he's Rey Mysterio. Is he still wrestling? Yes, actually. He's wrestling with his son, who is now old enough to be a wrestler as well. Good. I am glad for him. <laughs> Um, but so I really liked this match because, um, as a very large man myself, seeing Bronson, like, get up on the ropes and do everything that other people were doing was really cool to me. Um, how do they treat him because of his size? So they call him the thick boy, or they used to call him the thick boy, and it was Mm -hmm. always, like, something that he was part of. They never made fun of him for it. Mm -hmm. His current tagline is colossal because I think they wanted to avoid just insinuations of calling him thick. Yeah. But he is, he's treated fairly well. He hasn't won a title yet, but he's still, you know, pretty solid NXT talent. And they definitely don't like do any, anything to like, dunk on him because of his size or anything like that they treat him respectfully nice because some of the moves he's like he was like lifting johnny up with like with one hand by his neck that was awesome Mm -hmm. i um, i feel my favorite this is like a generic one but it is andre the giant because like i've only ever really watched his matches and like seeing how large he was and then like his whole backstory has always been something that's super interesting to Mm me um and it's just like seeing larger dudes like wrestle is always cool to me because I am a I'm a big dude. So like seeing that and then knowing he's not really like a joke because of that is awesome. Yeah. Um, I did like that Johnny came out in like that iron that like children's costume Iron Man. Yeah, yeah. So Johnny is married to Candice LeRae, who was in the previous match, and someone drew fan art of him and his like little faction of him, Austin Theory, the guy he came out with. Candace mm-hmm. and Indy and like drew them in superhero costumes. So Johnny was Iron Man and Candace was Thor. And for this takeover, they all made gear inspired by that fan art and like were very kind to the artist. And I thought that was really cool. That's all. I, I've always seen those. Like those are just um they just make those costumes and like Marvel's just cool with it. Yeah. They they have to officially say inspired by and not, you know, this is my Iron okay. Man costume or whatever. But yeah, like same way Marvel doesn't really like crack down on artists selling commissions or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like it would be bad press for everyone. Is it is it WWE or NXT where the one one person has like an, a Wolverine costume? Oh, uh, that was Johnny Gargano who had the Wolverine costume a couple years ago. Look at that. I knew something. Yeah, he is recently, actually, he also had an X-Man costume, like Nate Gray X-Man, because he's a big nerd. Hold on. He had just like a straight up Nate Gray like It, outfit? it was a little bit different. But it had his logo on it instead of the Nate Gray X. But let me see if I can find a picture of it. That's that's incredible. 
Um, hold on, I think I found it. Oh, on CBR.com. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he really had a Nate Gray. Yeah. What a nerd. Yeah, I love him. He's so good. That's incredible. Wow. And he's, is he, is he, a, okay, another, I've got another question for you. Mm-hmm. How many belts are there? In NXT, there is the NXT Championship, the biggest, mm-hmm. baddest belt at the company. There is the North American Championship, which is a rung below it. It's for wrestlers who are good, but not at the main event. There is the men's tag team titles, the recently created women's tag team titles, and the women's championship. And okay. also recently, the cruiserweight championship used to be defended on another WWE show called 205 Live, which was for people 205 pounds or less, who are all cruiserweights. But that has been de- an NXT mainstay since the pandemic started. So, like, a show like that, did, um, would that be on, like, another channel? Like, how does that work? 205 Live, I think, is on WWE Network, or now it's on Peacock, but it airs just live there like TakeOver did. Got it. So it's kind of like a a subdivision type show? Yeah. Okay. Because, like, the AEW does that in the dark show, Mm -hmm. or whatever it's called. So I'm try- just trying to find like how that works. Yeah, it's similar to that. Um, there's also Finn Balor and was it Karrion Cross? Yeah. Can I? I need you to explain Karrion Cross to me because like, is he a gladiator? Who is this woman with him? What's what's <laughs> what's going on? Okay, so I don't know him super well because All I'm right. not super into like indie wrestling in the U.S. But Karrion Cross, um. He used to go by Killer Cross on the indies. Scarlet mm-hmm. is the woman with him. She is a wrestler, although she hasn't wrestled for NXT yet. Uh, she is also his partner in real life. I don't know exactly their relationship status, but they are together. Um, That's nice. And as our friend Forrest has described it, his gimmick is literally that he is Woody Harrelson's character from Natural Born Killers. Like, it is directly that. I haven't seen Natural Born Killers, so I don't actually know what that entails. But he's just this really intense guy. He had, like, that little gladiator Jonski on. Um, Yeah, that was new. I hadn't seen that before. Since he's come to NXT, they've kind of tried to portray him as, like, this harbinger of doom. Like, you know, they start singing Fall and Pray during his entrance, like... They say TikTok to, like, the countdown. He's coming for you. He's supposed to be this, like, incredibly menacing bringer of destruction, basically. So, what... Is there, like, demons in this one? Like, does NXT believe that there's, like, aliens and stuff like that? Like, is that a... Um, no, not really. Finn Balor, um, before his recent return to NXT, when he was doing big matches he would dress himself in body paint and call himself the demon but it wasn't like treated as finn balor has been possessed by a demon it's finn balor does this to get in the zone got it okay so it's not like uh we talked this last night the fiend who's like a demon monster guy oh yeah i will say though the one time nxt did magic was with carrie and cross and scarlet where Carry, so, Karrion Cross, just for a little extra context for you, he won the NXT Championship, but got injured in the match that he won it, so he had to give up the championship the next show. Yikes. So, this match was his first NXT Championship match since he came back from that injury, so it was like, he's getting back what's his. But in that feud, to lead up to him winning the title for the first time, he was intimidating the current NXT champion Keith Lee and mm-hmm. he ha- and Scarlet ended up leaving a book in the ring and when Keith Lee picked up the book a fireball shot out of it and burned his face okay that has never been explained to this day they never followed up on it and there is just in NXT canon Scarlet made a fireball once yeah sure y- 
Yep, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, because I was going to talk about Finn Balor's like whole shtick because he was like a demon kind of, but I guess he wasn't. I guess that was just him like getting pumped. Yeah. Um, that match was good. It didn't. It didn't like blow me away. But I know the big one was Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly. So I would like to hear your thoughts first. I specifically didn't ask you about it last night because I wanted to hear your thoughts today. Yeah. So NXT has, before this, it has had exactly one unsanctioned match, and it's one of my favorites of all time. So this one was a little hard to live up to that. And I what still. What does that mean? Unsanctioned match? Yeah. In storyline, it basically means these guys have gone so far beating each other up that NXT is going to let them do whatever they want to each other. There okay. are no rules. The only rule is that you got to pin your opponent for a three count or make him tap out. The referee won't do anything else. OK, that makes sense to me, because like all this stuff was happening. I was like, I mean, the ref was knocked out, but I was like, is there what's what's the rules on this one? Yeah, but, uh, in okay. storyline, they have to sign contracts that say whatever happens here, like NXT is not mm. responsible. You did this to yourself. Hmm. OK, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no Go problem. On. So I really enjoyed the match. I have quibbles with it here and there, both comparing it to previous unsanctioned matches and stuff like that. But it was still a really enjoyable experience and well, as enjoyable as it is watching two men beat the crap out of each other. And mm -hmm. I was really into it by the end. There was a lot of crazy stuff going on. I am. Um, my favorite thing was probably the chain. Yeah, I would agree. Um, because when he strung that up and like made it taunt and gave him the clothesline with it. Yeah. I was like, oh, that had to hurt. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, man, it was it was like it got to a point where they were just like nobody was doing well, like both both parties were um, just like just beat down to like shit. Yeah, they, they were done. Um, So they've been friends for a long time. Is that the whole bit? Yeah. So the story going in strictly in NXT is that Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly and Another guy, Bobby Fish, joined NXT at the same time as a group called the Undisputed Era. And mm -hmm. they were these three hungry guys who eventually took on a fourth member. And they took, they were so good. They were such good compatriots that they went to the top. They all, there was a point in NXT when all four members of the Undisputed Era had all four men's titles at the company. Like, it was, they were the dominant group. And, then they started losing, and then none of them had titles anymore. And Adam Cole was the face of the group. He was the most popular wrestler before they came to NXT. And interestingly, he was a member of the Elite for a little while before he went to NXT. He was best friends with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. Huh. Okay. And Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks never were at NXT, WWE, or anything like that, right? Yeah, before AEW started, WWE was trying to recruit them, but then they got a call from a billionaire who said they could start their own wrestling company, so they picked that one. Uh, indubitably. Yeah. So, all th so these guys came in, they worked together, they were brothers, they had been a stable for four years. And then Kyle O'Reilly became the new face of the Undisputed Era. Adam Cole was no longer champion, and Kyle O'Reilly won a tournament to be the first challenger for Finn Balor as champion. And Adam, like, at the time, he was like, oh, I support my friend. Kyle's great. I think he can do it. And Kyle lost. And then he had a second match against Finn Balor, and he lost again. And then, as you saw during Finn Balor's match with um, Pete Dunne, at the end, Finn got beat down, and the Undisputed Era came out to save him. And Kyle, being a decent person, offered to, like, he said, hey, Finn, do you want to join? And that was the last straw for Adam Cole. 
So which one is like, so Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly, which one is the heel? Adam is the heel. Okay. Hmm. I, that makes sense. Um, the match, the match was incredible. Like at one point, I can't remember who was on the turn. It's a turnbuckle, right? The yeah. corner. Yeah. The turnbuckle. Someone was on the turnbuckle and got knocked off and then off out of the ring. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was Kyle. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what was, okay. What was your favorite part of the match? So you mentioned that one chain spot that was really good. I think my favorite part of the match was when Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly both fell through the stage. Yes, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. Like when he put him through like the metal grate part. Yeah. And because he came out like that was blood. Yeah. Like that. That could not have felt good. Mm -hmm. Um, So now that. That's over. Like, where do you think they go from there? So it's interesting because if I go just based on NXT's history, the last time they had an unsanctioned match like this was during Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa's very long feud. And it was Mm -hmm. the first like big match that they had against each other. And from there, they had two more pretty nasty matches one was a street fight and then one was a last man standing match and they just you know kept beating the crap out of each other so i could see them going like that i could see them saying all right adam cole and kyle o'reilly will continue to fight each other because even though kyle won like adam's not gonna forgive him right adam's gonna still try and Mm -hmm. beat him up but also i think this ends with kyle o'reilly winning the nxt championship Because I don't think you break up the Undisputed Era, and I don't think you make Kyle O'Reilly a singles wrestler and have him beat Adam Cole unless you want him to go all the way. I... And what nights... What nights... It's Tuesday comes on? Yeah, so it used to be on Wednesdays at the exact same time as AEW Dynamite. But because of some network issues, they are now moving to Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hmm. So it wasn't they didn't move because of um, AEW? No, yeah, they moved apparently because USA has some hockey content on Wednesdays now. But also, I think it's funny to say it was because of AEW, so I'm fine with either. I am. My like one last question is. How often do people go from NXT to WWE or vice versa? Is that something that happens often? Yeah, it's fairly often that NXT wrestlers will go to the main roster. Usually uh, someone who is NXT champion or is NXT women's champion, when they lose the championship, a few months later, they will show up on the main WWE shows. It is exceedingly rare for WWE people to go back down to NXT. It only really started happening because Finn Balor wanted to go back in 2019. And since him, I think only three other people have come back down. Huh. So why did Finn Balor go back down? He so... This is kind of interesting trivia. So Finn Balor, um, when he he when he got the NXT Championship back in like 2014, 2015, he had the longest title reign of the NXT Championship. And when he eventually lost his title, he went up to the main roster where they immediately uh, chose him to win the WWE Universal Championship. But. In the Universal Championship match against Seth Rollins, he got injured. He tore his shoulder and he had to give it up the very next day. And ever since then, his career at WWE kind of floundered because they didn't feel comfortable continuing to invest in him because they, from their point of view, we invested in this guy. We gave him literally the top spot at the company and then he was gone for six months. So... WWE doesn't treat people who get injured well, and they especially don't treat people who get injured in big matches well. So he spent a while from 2015 or 2016, I think, all the way to 2019, just kind of messing around, 
not he won their Intercontinental Championship, which was which is like the NXT North American Championship. He mm. won that a few times, but he never really had a substantial career there. And at a certain point, when AEW Dynamite started, NXT, because they were in the same time slot, NXT decided that they needed to compete. So they brought down Finn Balor, who at that point was the most popular champion of NXT, former champion of NXT. And reports have it that he was originally only supposed to stay for like six months before going back. But Mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, they just kept him there and he ended up having the greatest stretch of his career. Yeah, I think I think just some people do better in different situations. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, this was this was great. I am. Wrestling's awesome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I every time I talk about it, I just get more and more excited about the different things. So thanks for talking to me about this. Yeah, of course. Um, Where do you have any projects you want to plug? Is there anything? Is there a place people can find you? Um, I don't really have any ongoing projects right now. Um, I guess I'm writing about Department of Truth for Comics XF, and I think that's the only thing I'm writing for them right now. You Mm -hmm. can find me on Twitter at vgola87 um i think that's the only social i have um i write for comics xf on occasion i write for aipt on occasion i think those are the oh i write and edit for comic book herald don't tell dave that i almost forgot that <laughs> i have to i have to actually write something for dave this weekend about resurrection man Ooh, exciting the one the one guy out here screaming about Mitch Shelley. Love that guy. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, you can thanks catch for having us me. at Gatecrashers Pod on Twitter. You can find us at our website at gatecrashers.fan. We have a lot more content coming. Um, and we'll see you next week. 